we know today, or maybe not. But properly preparing our students, we are going to need more than just education designed to promote cognitive ability and acquisition information. We're going to need to make sure that our students are developed with imaginative thinking, thinking that enables them to perceive events clearly and comprehend the situation fully, envision new solution for seemingly unsolvable problems. They will also need a capacity for emotional involvement that is both sensitive and resilient so that they are strong enough to weather the emotional storms that arises and yet sensitive enough to look beyond the obvious and hear what is not spoken. These are the words of Jack Pertrash, the author of Teaching from Inside Out. These words means a lot. It's, it's the work that we do around our social emotional learning here in our district. And tonight we're going to learn a little bit more about what social emotional learning will look like for our school district. You're going to learn a little bit more about our collaborative for academic social emotional learning, CASEL. They're here to talk a little bit about who they are and their relationship to our district. You're going to hear a little bit more about the collaborative district initiative and the, the, the target of implementing social emotional learning district wide. You'll get a quick introduction about social emotional learning and, in, and its impact on academic learning and instruction and career and college readiness and developing positive youth development. You'll learn more about what's already happening. Um, our McClatchy Network will speak a little bit about what's happening on their school sites to give you an idea of where we are as a district. And then you're going to learn a little bit more around our next step for effectively implementing SEL into our district programming practices and policies. So I'm going to turn the presentation over to Sue and Hector, and they're going to give you a little bit more information about CASEL and social emotional learning. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Kua. Board members, uh, Dr. Olivine Roberts, good evening, and it's an absolute pleasure uh, to be with you this evening to share a little bit about uh, some of the great things that are going on here in your school district regarding social and emotional learning. But before I get started, I really do want to acknowledge the fact that the book of uh, support, the champion for social emotional learning, of course, has been your superintendent of schools, uh, you know, Mr. Raymond, uh, Raymond. And also, I uh, want to acknowledge the work that uh, KUA has done to also support and to uh, gather the troops together in order for us to move forward uh, with the implementation of social emotional learning. And of course, working with the Division of Academics, who Dr. Olivine Roberts has been a real plus in helping us get grounded and established in the school district so that we get our bearings straight as to what the needs of the school district are and how we can provide technical support in order to have systemic and sustainable implementation of social emotional learning. As you can see, that CASEL is part of the Collaborative for Academic Social Emotional Learning. It was uh, first founded in 1984, and one of the uh, more significant founders of uh, CASEL was um, Daniel Goldman, who wrote the uh, renowned book, the very powerful book on emotional intelligence. And that has been the basis of much of the work that we've done on social emotional intelligence. The uh, focus of uh, CASEL has been to advance the science of SEL. There has been a significant research, not only on the development of programs to establish a social-emotional climate and balance with the academic and cognitive development of a child, but also there's been evidence to show that the implementation of social-emotional uh, skills and learning has really resulted in increased academic performance, the decline in disruptive behavior, and capacity for children to uh, develop decision-making skills and uh, levels of responsibility in which it will help them out in later life. In addition, expanding effective SEL practice. Uh, that, I think, is very significant. In looking at evidence-based research and evidence-based programming, that we have found that there are a number of programs that have been very successful in implementing social emotional programming in schools. And we have had the opportunity to take a look at some of the programs here in the district, and there are several uh, already in place, such as Second Step, that has been implemented in several of your schools. And we're taking a close look at how that can also be embedded in much of the training that we are providing. Also, improving state and federal policies. Beginning at the local level, uh, school districts and school boards across the country are taking a look at balancing the cognitive development of children, and that is to balance it with the social-emotional 
uh, aspect of learning, which involves the collaborative decision making, uh, cooperative learning uh, skills, as well as a 21st century and career and uh, technical development for our children to, uh, in turn, uh, advance their careers later on in life. Uh, in addition, Castle coordinates uh, the collaborative together so that we can share information with the eight districts that have become a part of this uh, initiative. And I'll share with that uh, information with you about that in a few minutes here. The Collaborating Districts Initiative, that's the castle, is the teaming with large urban school districts and to implement the district-wide SEL. The first three districts that come online were the Anchorage, uh, school district, Austin, and also Cleveland. That was over a year ago. So they're part of the first cohort to implement the uh, strategies for SEL uh, systemic implementation. Now we visited here in the school district and I think a couple of you visited with some of our team that came last November. And since then, there are five additional school districts that have come online as a part of the CDI uh, uh, network. And that's Chicago, Nashville, Oakland, and Sacramento, as well as Washoe County. In addition, the Council Collaborative District Initiative process and timeline include the first step. So after the visit that we had in November, uh, the district was accepted uh, to uh, launch the planning stage. And that was the first uh, initiative that was um, implemented here. And that was from February 2012 to September. And at that time, the district received a Novo Foundation funding, a planning grant of $125,000. And during that time, uh, we as uh, consultants and as uh, advisors to the district through the Castle Foundation uh, came and visited and helped the district develop the long-term implementation plan. And so in that process, we met with many of your staff, visited several of your schools, uh, took a look at the needs, and also uh, implemented some uh, uh, information gathering process. They're, they're in place now and then part of the packet that went to Novo for the implementation plan. And the second stage is the uh, implementation phase itself. And that begins on November 12th. And I want to congratulate you for uh, receiving the award for the implementation uh, uh, phase that uh, begins in November and ends in July of 2015. And part of that is a three-year implementation grant of $250,000 a year. And that includes uh, material supplies for substitutes, for staffing, and so forth. So we're really happy that the district has been a part of that uh, award. Part of the Collaborative uh, Districts Initiative is, is the theory of action. And this is based on extensive research on the specific strategies and steps that have been proven to be effective to implement social emotional learning district wide and to do it systemically and ensure sustainability over time. I will talk to you just a little bit more about the castle's input and role, but also the district activities. Uh, one of the things that you had to do initially was to uh, have a needs assessment and to uh, take an inventory of your resources, uh, develop a clear vision and long-term plans, develop learning standards and assessments, which will, this will be part of the implementation plan. In addition to that, there are some district outcomes that we do expect as a result of your participation in this initiative. And that's a long-term plan for social emotional learning uh, policies on the part of the school board, uh, developing standards that can be implemented within your curriculum, as well as embedding uh, within the budget. And our goal is not only to provide funding at this time, but also to help raise additional funds to help sustain the, this initiative. School and classroom student outcomes uh, improve SEL competence at all grade levels. And we hope to see these outcomes as a result of the district-wide implementation. Now, one of the things that I think it's important for you to uh, take a look at is, is that the, um, the CASEL input provides the support of the systems advisor. Uh, we are here for the long haul, and that is not uh, uh, separate um, uh, from the CAS overall cash flow initi initiative, we are a, a core part of the overall support that CAS is providing school districts uh, uh, across the country, or at least the eight districts that we've talked about. But um, uh, Sue is providing uh, the work in terms of professional development. So you have two uh, Castle support staff that are here to see this through all the way through the end of the funding cycle. Professional development and consultation, we've had many, many opportunities to train the stakeholders, 
Uh, also the cabinet, we've worked with the managers for a summer of service program, the planning team. We just did a training with the planning team. And what we want to do is to help develop trainers that can continue to uh, uh, train the faculty and staff uh, on your campuses. Uh, even uh, Katrina attended our training yesterday, and so it was really a, a real pleasure to see her attend our, our work. Uh, community of, of learners, you're a part of the CDI districts, and you'll be coming together. We'll be uh, bringing in uh, some of your key stakeholders to Austin this coming November to interface with the other districts that are part of this uh, initiative and uh, superintendents will also be participating and comparing notes as to what it takes to implement uh, the initiative district-wide. And these are the rest of the items that goes down to the funding as well. But uh, at this time I want to ask Sue to come forward and share with you a little bit more about what the competencies look like for social emotional learning. Hey, good evening, board members, Dr. Roberts. It's a privilege to be here tonight to share with you this introduction to social and emotional learning and its uh, potential for uh, your district. We're so excited at Castle to be part of this initiative. We, um, we begin by asking ourselves, what comes to mind when we hear the word social and emotional learning? And one thing is the social aspect of learning, the collaboration, the cooperation, the learning together, the supporting of one another. We think about the emotional aspect of learning. We think about what motivates us, what we care about, what we have passion about. We know that we can never separate a child from all the parts of him or herself. So we're looking at educating the whole child. And what does that mean for us? When we take a look at this definition of social and emotional learning, it involves several things that are so important to this initiative. One is that social and emotional learning is a process. It's one in which children and adults are cultivating competencies within themselves that help them achieve their potential. And those competencies would be the fundamental skills that if we look into our own lives, have made us successful, not just in our careers, but in our relationships, in our satisfaction in life, and our ability to serve and contribute. So we're looking at skills that help us to manage our emotions, to set and achieve goals. We're looking at those skills that help us to have empathy and compassion and connection with others to establish and maintain and sustain positive relationships, and to make positive and wise choices and decisions. So the competencies that have been established, that are research-based and have been shown to have a significant impact on learning and on success in life, are these five. One is self-awareness, the ability to look within and to reflect on our own behavior. Another one is our self-management, our ability to delay gratification, control our impulses so that we're able to follow through and achieve our goals in life. A third is our social awareness, our ability to recognize our impact on others, to understand perspectives of others. Relationship skills, the whole range of communication skills that allow us to connect with people, to connect with ourselves, to make a contribution. And finally, responsible decision-making, that ability for us to make healthy and wise choices. When we look at this body of skills, they have been significantly correlated with improvements in academic success, pro-social behavior, improvements in attitudes about self and others, as well as reductions in misconduct and emotional distress. We might ask ourselves, why would that be? If we take a look at these skills, the self-awareness skills are the ones that allow us to know ourselves, recognize our strengths, have that accurate self-perception so that we can begin to imagine our own ability to contribute, our self-confidence that cannot be shaken. The self-management skills are the ones that allow us to delay that gratification so that we can achieve our goals, to organize ourselves, to be able to, to follow through, to motivate ourselves 
our third set, social awareness, our ability to look at perspectives outside of our own so that we can take in learning that's broader than we could imagine. The relationship skills, the speaking, reading, writing, listening, working cooperatively, resolving conflicts, asking and seeking the help that we need, would be correlated to learning because we have to be able to collaborate with one another, to work together as a team, to support each other's goals in our learning. And finally, responsible decision making. Problem identification, being able to evaluate and reflect and make responsible and ethical decisions. This body of skills has been shown to be correlated to success in school and in life. We want you to see some examples of why this would be so. And so Hector, I'm going to ask you to uh, start our video for us. And in this video, we'd like you to take a look at the following. Now before we um, actually get started, there is, um, uh, I think I need my Yeah. Uh, I wanna acknowledge a few individuals that actually were very instrumental in helping to develop uh, the implementation plan. So I'd like to ask if there's anybody here in the audience that uh, participated in the planning team, please stand to be recognized. I think there's a few individuals here. Uh, if you are also participating in writing the implementation plan, is anybody here that uh, was a part of that? So I know Sarah, I know you were there. Yes. <laughs> so I think they're a little bit shy tonight, you know. But I will say that uh, within your packet, uh, I want to refer to the timeline for the three-year implementation strategy that's included in your, your packet. So I would like you to take a look at this video, and I think it's very telling about the impact and the strategies that are used within the classroom and, it, and the impact that it has on children uh, to implement uh, um, uh, uh, evidence-based programming and also to help children think critically about their behaviors and their relationships. Uh, as listed on the uh, screen, take a look at the explicit SEL skills instruction. You'll see some very explicit activities going on, research that supports it. Uh, Daniel Goldman is interviewed and he is in a sense, the godfather of emotional intelligence and the research that came out in the early 90s, as well as the SEL connection to academic success, which I think is very significant and does have an impact. Next tonight, learning about reading, writing, and feelings. Our story comes from special correspondent John Talenko of Learning Matters, which produces education stories for the news hour. My name is Claudia, and when I'm very angry, I cry and scream. Once a week in Shirley Guerrero's fourth grade classroom, students set aside academics to focus on a different kind of learning. I feel angry when you bother me because I need respect. I feel disrespectful. Guerrero's students at Public School 24 in Brooklyn, New York, are learning to identify their feelings and communicate what's behind them. It's part of a small but growing movement in education called social and emotional learning. Today's lesson is about self-expression using what's called an I message. Okay. My name is Julia, and when I'm angry, um, I like want to yell at people. Like, for an I message is basically a way to communicate. It opens up communication and it helps kids do exactly that, express their feelings and what they need. We have to talk about what we feel because that's the only way that we're going to solve our problems. Okay. A lot of children hold in what they're feeling and then that's what interferes with their learning. We're going to embrace the anger, but we're going to transform Watching it. you in your class, I, I, I thought, she's, her, she's their therapist. <laughs> no, far from it. That's not what we're doing. It's not about therapy. <laughs> it's about giving them the tools they need um, so that they can deal with those emotions so that they can focus on the academics. So pay attention to what I'm doing and then you're going to try to... Do Down the hall, a different kind of lesson. The teacher is Martine Alvarado. Okay, so Kevin, you want to start? Um, Mr. Alvarado, I have a problem outside in the schoolyard that a kid is calling me a midget and... Mr. Rada? Yes. My lesson today was on active listening. I wanted them to actually see what poor listening looked like. I can't do stuff because I'm weak. Mr. Rada, are you listening? Yes, I'm listening. 
<laughs> if you're actively listening, you can better understand where one person is coming from, from their own point of view. Yes. <laughs> All right, so what, what, what happened there? Who would like to share out? We're trying to teach kids here um, how to get along with one another, how to speak with each other, how to be respectful, how to alleviate conflict. This is a curriculum that gives students a voice. It gives them a time to reflect. Action! Lessons like these are taught throughout this school and now in about 10% of public schools nationwide. States are getting behind it, making social and emotional learning a requirement. The movement started with this book, Emotional Intelligence, by psychologist and science writer Daniel Goldman. Social and emotional learning is life skill training. What are the skills? Well, self-awareness is, is the basis of good judgment in life. Managing your distressing emotions is going to help you in any situation. Empathy and sensing how other people are feeling and using that to create rapport and chemistry means you're going to have rich relationships. Social skill, getting along well, learning how to work out difficulties and disagreements in a win-win way, these are uh, life skills any parent would want for their child. Interest in the field has risen as families and children face greater economic and social strains. There are some children who, uh, for whatever reason, uh, have real deficits in social skill, uh, in attention, in uh, emotional self-control, which is why I think it's so heartening that these uh, social-emotional learning programs help those kids the most, because it helps them uh, get a more equal playing field for the rest of their lives. Helping students manage emotions and find ways to get along could also help teachers. In national surveys, they've consistently identified disruptive behavior and discipline problems as top concerns. There was a lot of aggression within my classroom. And when we covered a lot of what to do when we're feeling angry, that helped the students. They know how to handle the anger. They know how to stop and think. I think stopping and thinking is, is a, a, a key skill that they need to be able to do. When we leave the school or at home, we know how to solve our problems. These fourth and fifth graders at Public School 24 say they've changed because of the things they've learned in school. What do you get out of talking about your feelings? When I share my feelings now with other people, I feel safe and I feel like um, I can let my feelings out. It doesn't stay inside of me. Has this class helped you? I used to get, like if somebody said something to me, I used to get so angry. I learned to like relax for a second and, st and like think about what I was going to do next, like instead of just acting out of the wild. What's different about you? Whenever someone wanted to be my friend, I used to like move away from them. And now I learned that, um, that get, to, get to knowing people is much better. So like you could like, like share your stuff with them and you could trust them. The more relaxed they are, you know, the less problems they have, the less emotions or negative emotions that they're feeling, the better able they are to deal with the academics. Teachers at Public School 24 say that's what they're seeing. Test scores here have risen, and the school has an A rating from the New York City Department of Education. And a new report analyzed results for some 300,000 students nationwide in schools that teach social and emotional skills. 10% less antisocial behavior. You know what that means? It means that children are better behaved. Fewer kids in middle school sent to the principal because they're fighting. All of that goes down. The other thing is that the positive behaviors go up 10%. Listening in class, not cutting class, liking school, enjoying my education, feel I'm bonded with a the teacher, there's someone at school that cares about me. Up 10%, bottom line, this is spectacular, Acad academic achievement test scores up 11%. At the same time, however, Goldman cautions that when students become adults, academics may only take them so far. The education that we get is essential. It's the necessary platform. It's not sufficient for success, for outstanding performance. What distinguishes you is how you manage yourself and how you handle your relationships, something completely other than the standard curriculum in school. 
To raise test scores, schools have piled on the academics, devoting more time to math and reading, and less to things like social and emotional learning. If they focus on test scores, they're focusing too much on data and numbers. But if you have this class, when they become adults, they'll have better skills, uh, they'll have better relationships, they'll know what to do when there's conflict. I think that's, that's the payoff, when they become adults. But while they're still children, they'll bring emotions to school, whether they're learning to handle them or not. So there are many good practices already occurring in this school district that I think that's what made uh, this school district uh, certainly a, a prime candidate to uh, be uh, a participant in the Collaborative for Academic Social Emotional Learning. Ultimately, we want all of your children to be prepared for college and career. And part of the effort and initiative you saw in the video is that ability to collaborate to think critically and have effective problem-solving skills. And ultimately, that's what's going to pay off in the long run for your children. We want your children to be prepared for the 21st century. But in order for us to do that, I think it's critical that the adults also demonstrate SEL competency and also learning ability. So we have a few examples of definitions that are in your handout that really, I think, resonate with a lot of folks that we have shared this with in our training. First of all, adults who have the ability to recognize, understand, label, express, and regulate emotions are more likely to demonstrate patience and empathy, encourage healthy communication, and create safe and learning environments. In our last training yesterday, we asked the participants to point out words that kind of resonated with them, and they point out many of the uh, characteristics uh, that describe adult competencies in SEL uh, a learning, but most importantly is the last sentence there, or last part of the sentence is create safe uh, uh, learning environments. Second of all, emotional skills of teachers influence student conduct. We know that through the research, we've seen that in practice. Also engagement, attachment to school, and academic performance. As I mentioned, that uh, we saw many classrooms using cooperative learning. Instead of the teacher-centered lectured approach, students were actively engaged in learning, uh, problem-solving, decision-making, in which these are the skills that really would like to, we would like to see promoted more often. As well as teachers skilled at regulating their emotions report less burnout and more positive effect while uh, teaching. Uh, nationally, the uh, attrition rate of teachers between the third and fifth year is nearly 50%. And part of that issue has to do with the high stress of the position and the demands that they have. And so uh, we look at the research that really does support uh, teachers and helping them regulate their emotions. And finally, school leaders with strong SEL competencies build and maintain positive and trusting relationships among members of the school community. Uh, I've been in education for many years, and I am a strong believer that the principal can help set the tone of the school. And so we are really focusing on developing those skills in the leadership team here at uh, uh, Sac City. Also, uh, we have an, an instrument that we like to use in our training, and we want to help the adults that go through the training develop their SEL competencies. And this is the personal assessment and reflection. Now, the SEL competencies for school leaders, staff, and adults who support SEL looks like this. And this is just one of the competencies. And you can see that there are uh, domains, for example, social self-awareness, uh, self-perception, uh, also self-confidence. And we would like to have the participants of our workshops rate themselves, dialogue about those areas that they would like to develop further, and also talk about their strengths. So I think it really plays well into having adults reflect not only on their level of understanding of social emotional learning, but also their level of competency to demonstrate, to model, to reinforce in children uh, school-wide so that this can become more systemic and effective throughout your school district. We're going to talk a little bit more about the SEL Improved Student Outcome, Sue. Thank you. 
So I'd like to draw your attention in your packet of materials to the meta-analysis, which was a landmark review supported by the WT Grant Foundation and the Lucille Packard Foundation for Children's Mental Health, conducted by Castle President and CEO Roger Weisberg and Joseph Durlach, the professor of clinical psychology at Loyola. It was a meta-analysis, first one ever, of 213 positive youth development, SEL, character education and prevention interventions. This was a scientifically rigorous controlled outcome research study. And here's what we found, that when social and emotional learning programs are systemically implemented, they have an impact significantly on social and emotional skills, on improved attitudes about self, others, and school, positive classroom behaviors, and an 11 to 17 percentile point gain on standardized achievement tests. This finding is unprecedented, and it causes us to ask ourselves, what is it about the teaching, modeling, and reinforcing of these particular skill sets that would have that significant of an impact on academic achievements. It also shows reduced risk for failures in conduct problems and emotional distress. So in other words, we're impacting both the behaviors that we want to cultivate and those that we're helping children to avoid and resist. Our logic model in social and emotional learning looks like this. If evidence-based, that is programs that have been shown to be effective, explicitly teach the five core competencies within the context of a positive learning climate with instructional strategies that teach, model, and reinforce these skills, the pedagogy that supports these five core competencies. The research shows that students will have a greater attachment and commitment to school and less risky behaviors. And it makes sense as students are feeling more confident and safer in their school environment. And as their academic achievement is going up and their connection to school is increasing and their contribution to what uh, matters at school is starting to be recognized, there's going to be a greater bonding to both the school and those adults who are supporting that uh, healthy growth and development. At the same time that students are learning to regulate their own behaviors. And as they learn to regulate those behaviors, they'll be less likely to have the unfortunate consequences that those impulsive behaviors lead to. And finally, the long-term outcomes of greater success in school, in work, and in life that Dr. Daniel Goleman was talking about in that uh, video that you just saw. So here is something that will become the framework here in, um, in uh, Sacramento City Unified School District, and that is the SAFE framework. This is very important. And that is that we know that the results we found in the meta-analysis were the result of sequenced activities that develop these skills with active and engaging forms of learning, focused attention in the curriculum, time that's actually dedicated to the teaching of these skills so that we're assured that every student in grades K through 12 is actually learning these skills, assimilating them, and having opportunities to demonstrate them. And finally, explicit instruction. That is, these skills are not only being integrated into the curriculum, but they're being named, identified, demonstrated, practiced, practiced, reflected upon, and ultimately become part of the culture and the climate of the school and part of the pedagogy of the uh, instructional philosophy of the district. So what you'll see with social and emotional learning is less of what is on our left-hand side, the lecture, the disconnected learning, the rote learning, the independent learning, separate from any opportunity to collaborate, the teacher-directed learning, the compliance-based learning. And instead, we'll see more inquiry-based, project-based learning, cooperative and collaborative types of learning, higher-order thinking skills, critical thinking, student-centered learning, and students assessing their own learning and reflecting on their own learning. We know that these are higher levels of pedagogy, and they're what we'll see as we promote SEL throughout the curriculum. 
I'm going to just touch very briefly on these two next slides because we want the students to come up here and share with you a little bit of their experience and insight in working uh, with social emotional learning. Uh, first of all, the Common Core State Standards, as you know, the district has adopted wholeheartedly and very aggressively under the leadership of uh, Dr. Olivine Roberts, the Common Core State Standards. And I know that training has been going on both in the language arts and I think this year in mathematics. But there is commonality especially when it comes to the uh, balancing uh, and the implementation of social emotional learning in the context of your core curriculum. Now the common core state standards require deeper understanding of core skills and uh, also apply to them. But one of the things that we are focusing on is changes in the instructional practices that are in alignment with and promote social emotional learning. It is not just delivering the content. It is about creating the learning environment that we described earlier and what you saw in the video that is highly engaging, it's interactive, and it prepares students to think critically, to be able to articulate uh, parts of their uh, the language and also be able to interact regarding mathematic skills. Student acquisition of social emotional skills is very critical. Fundamental changes to pedagogy, which are the teaching practices as well as safe and supportive classroom context where children feel comfortable to ask questions, to challenge, to interact, and to participate. And this is what the focus is in balancing between the Common Core and also SEL. In addition, merging uh, the positive behavioral interventions and support, which has been adopted by several of your schools, in particular uh, the McClatchy uh, Network, have adopted the PBIS program and they have uh, embraced the integration of SEL with the PBIS implementation as well. And so quickly, it's, it's about commitment to school-wide social culture, redefining how children behave and levels of responsibility and interaction, commitment to building personal competence of students, linking social development with academic success, using SEL curriculum to define core social expectations for school, and ultimately using SEL framework for elabor elaborating a multi-tiered system of support. So this is the focus of, of SEL and integrating with already uh, existing initiatives of the school district. So. So uh, in conclusion on this part of it, we uh, talk about the opportunity for social and emotional learning as a universal skill set to be uh, a coordinating framework in the sense that it can help districts and schools move from siloed efforts that oftentimes are not even aware of one another or often do not have that uh, common language and moving that to a much more integrated uh, whole, as you can see. So we're building on student strengths, academic and life success, coordinating the efforts in the district in a way of asking ourselves in what ways in all venues and all opportunities, every time the right time, every place the right place, to teach, to model, and to reinforce the five core competencies that our research shows have such a significant impact on students' whole development. That is the ultimate purpose of social and emotional learning. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Kua. Thank you so much. And so at this time, I did want to um, provide the board an opportunity to hear from our actual schools, our, our networks of schools, and learn more about what they are doing with social emotional learning on their school site. So I'm going to invite our, um, uh, our student and parent participations tonight to come up here. Um, um, first, we're going to start off with Leah Tata Floyd. I'm going to ask uh, Sarahville uh, to elementary school to also come up here, our stingrays, and uh, Cal Middle School as well. Um, and then also our parents from uh, CK McClatchy, they're going to share a little bit about what they've been doing as a feeder pattern networks of schools working together collaboratively around social emotional learning and positive behavior intervention supports. Thank you, Kua. Um, board members, uh, Dr. Roberts. Folks from Castle, thank you very much for giving us the opportunity to share a little bit about the most important work that we as a network of schools are doing. And we truly are a network of schools. Part of the reason why we're standing up here is our four school communities share a very distinct feeder pattern, meaning most of the students from Leotata Floyd Elementary School go 
to McClatchy, uh, to Cal Middle, and most of the kids from Cal Middle go to McClatchy High. And that's a unique but also a special thing for the four schools that are represented here because we share this commonality of students, families, and community. We also share the commonality and pedagogy of practice of social emotional learning, positive behavior, intervention and support service, and inclusive practices. So I just wanted to say thank you very much for listening to this most important work. And I have the pleasure and the honor, oops, before I do that, we're having our renaming ceremony this Saturday. I expect to see all the board members there. I will save you each a hot dog, two to four, and I expect you to dance with our school community. But before, uh, as I put that plug in, let me, uh, Go ahead and take the pleasure of introducing two important people to the work that we are doing. Um, I have a parent that is here who's going to be able to talk about social emotional learning from her perspective. Her name's Alicia Daniels, and I have a student who's going to be able to talk about her perspective of social emotional learning, and her name is Kariah Bowling. What's exciting is that Kariah's older sister actually goes to California Middle School and is in seventh grade there and is really learning a lot playing the. Uh, uh, the saxophone in the band. So can, ladies, can you come up? So, Ms. Daniels, why don't you start talking about <laughs> social emotional learning in your perspective, and then we'll allow Kariah to speak. Good evening, board members, Dr. Roberts. Um, I appreciate the program of the social emotional learning that they use at the school. Um, I kind of came to talk about a little bit about my son. He's kindergarten and he's special needs. And so I appreciate that our school has adopted the inclusive practice. Um, he's learning how to deal with some of his issues and some of his problems. And also the main thing to me is the social part. Um, him seeing what the kids are doing and, you know, kind of like not mocking or mimicking, but um, I don't know what what kind of words I could use, but him just learning from them and them being a positive role model, um, me going back and forth in his class because I am on campus all day um, there and I see them doing class meetings and, you know, the kids go up if they have a problem during the day, they go up and write their name on the board and then at the end of the day, the teacher comes and does the class meeting and she calls whoever's name is up there and they talk about their problems and one of the things that I really enjoyed when I was in a class meeting is that almost everyone in the circle had a compliment for my son. And what they see, I don't see at home, but me being there and kind of learning how the school is dealing with um, behavioral problems and all of the above, it's helped me as a parent to do the same thing at home. And so I just appreciate um, Castle for um, putting this together and I just am happy about it because now I, I can get more input and stuff on how to raise my kid with Down syndrome. Karai is a little bit nervous. I can't believe that she's a little bit nervous because I've never seen her so shy. But um, Karai, in supporting you and talking about this, can you explain what is the Panther Way, which is our school's approach to positive behavior intervention and support? So what are the three uh, expectations of the Panther Way? Um, being hardworking, respectful, and responsible. Right. Now, at our school, we explicitly recognize students who show those three qualities. How do we recognize or give students support? How do we sh acknowledge them for uh, showing those three things? Um, What's given to students? Now, do we, do, we give, do we give students uh, Panther Way tickets? Yes. Now, why do we do that? Do we do that to make sure that we positively acknowledge all of our students? Yes. Okay, great. Now, can you tell the board about the social emotional learning curriculum that is taught universally at our school's second step. What happens during a second step lesson? So during the second step lesson, do the teachers 
model and talk about emotions, problem solving skills, and different concepts that help us feel safe at school and know how to deal with not only our personal problems, but problems in our lives and problems that we deal with academically. Yes. You're very good at acknowledging all this. Thank you so much. Yeah, so is there anything else you'd like to share about the meaning of the Panther Way in your life at uh, Leah Tata Floyd Elementary School? No. Okay. <laughs> so thank you very much. I'm very proud of you for being able to come and share your perspective, Ms. Bowling. And I can't believe how little you had to say. I'll expect you to be this focused and quiet at school tomorrow. Okay. So um, I'm going to go ahead and hand things over to Sutterville Elementary School. Again, it is my honor to have both Ms. Daniels and Ms. Bowling come up and share a little bit about this important work that isn't just happening for the kids at our school. It's happening for a network of schools that all have taken the ownership of establishing these important life skills that our students learn. So our kids might have the Panther Way at uh, Leah Tata Floyd, but when they go to Cal, they'll have to learn about being sick. And when they go to McClatchy, they'll have to learn about Roar. And all of these things are hopefully linked together to provide um, confidence for our students in being successful in navigating our school district. So thank you. Thank you. And for the record, I've been to Tata Floyd School, and none of the children are shy. So I just think it's like camera shy today. <laughs> I'm going to have the Sutterville Elementary School students come up and speak a little bit about what they do at, as stingrays there. Hello, my name is Eli, and this is Cami, my partner. And this is what we're learning about the seven habits. We are just now learning about seven habits. When we are productive, we solve problems before there are consequences. We don't blame others. We take care of our classroom so that it stays in good condition. We notice when classmates need help and we help them before being asked. Our goal is to be good at reading, writing, and math when we are adults. To do this, we do our work every day before we play. First grade, and we we will be talking about the win-win at lunch recess when kids get the jump rope and they are no more left. Share we win. Okay, so what they're talking about are the seven habits of healthy kids, and it's basically Stephen Covey's seven habits for highly effective people that's um, been geared for children. So they're talking about being proactive and think win-win and concepts that sometimes are difficult for adults, but um, it's amazing how quickly students can learn when they have the opportunity. Thank you, Gwen. Gwen is in first grade. Hi, my name is Natalia Cazares, and I'm in sixth grade. I think it's really important to have the seven habits because they show you steps to be a better person. Habits are the actions we do every day. There are really, there are seven really important habits we should have, like habit number one, be proactive, so you could be the leader of your life. Habit number two, begin with the end in mind. 
and start with the plan. Habit number three, put first, first things first and do important things first. And habit number four, think win-win, find ways everyone can win. Habit number five, seek first to understand, then to be understood, and listen first, and then talk. Habit number six, synergize and work together to do better. Hi, my name is Anthony Shaney Felt, and class meetings is a way to discuss problems or compliment people for what they do. Um, sometimes you can do an I statement, which is where you announce a problem that has happened on the playground or in the classroom or um, like outside of the class and you need to kind of get it out, shake it off. So that's a class meeting. Thank you, sixth graders, and thank you to our teachers who are here and supporting them, Robin Can and Michelle Apperson. Awesome. All right, I'll turn it over to Cal. Okay. Good evening, President Rodriguez, Dr. Roberts, and board members. I'm going to let uh, Cal speak for themselves, but I wanted to clarify. Mr. Eidlitz said earlier that we encourage our students to be sick, and I wanted to um, you'll hear what that means. We really don't encourage our students to be sick. So they will explain what that means in case there was any confusion there. Good evening, President Rodriguez, Dr. Roberts, and, and board members. My name is Haley Ochoa, and I am a seventh grader at California Middle School. At Cal, we have three school rules. Be safe, show integrity, and be considerate. Six stands for those three rules. Our positive behavior matrix tells us how to follow those rules in all parts of the school, like hallways, classrooms, the cafeteria, and the gym. We are rewarded with sick tickets when the staff see us use being sick. Then we are able to put them in drawings every Friday and win prizes. On my first day of school, we had to watch videos in each class. They had students in them demonstrating sick behaviors. It was cool. We all knew how to be sick from the very beginning. Good evening, President, er, President Rodriguez, Dr. Roberts, and members of the board. My name is Matthew Tomanaha, and I'm a seventh grade student at California Middle School. Um, I will be talking about the SEL in Common Core. SEL helps us promote a positive rather than negative, so we are told what to do, not what not to do. And Common Core helps a lot for collaboration and working together by uh, using group projects and group works and having other students help us and edit our papers. Um, I think interacting helps a lot. So that way, instead of just going out of the textbook and doing individual things, we get to communicate and get better results than we used to. Hello, my name is Jack Lyons. Uh, nice to see you, President Rodriguez members of the board, and Dr. Roberts. I will be talking about how the SEL program helps us further our education throughout our educational career and through our own career. All right. So in SEL, you learn about how to communicate with each other while doing common core work. Now. While doing the common core work, there's a lot of working together, and I believe that as you're working together, it furthers your education because one mind is better than two. One, two minds is better than one. Eh. <laughs> Sorry. So I believe that also that as you get into college and hi high school and college, that you need those educational, you need those communication and educational skills to work together. Also, as you're getting a job, most all careers need you to work with other people and collaborate. Thank you, everybody. And I guess that's it. I wanted to check to see if we have our McClatchy parents, our student here tonight. I know there was a couple things happening at McClatchy, so, okay. So we're gonna move on. Uh, but McClatchy is our high school um, uh, uh, as part of our network of uh, SEL network uh, work. I'm going to go ahead and go to the next slide here.
Can you guys hear me? Okay. So instead of going through the detailed three-year implementation plan that we submitted to CASEL, I wanted to highlight just a couple of next steps for year one, year two, year three. When we got together as a planning team, we, we knew that we had to really think about the type of work and the type of rollout we wanted to bring to our school district. In our first self-assessment of where we were as a district, we found that there were some great schools doing great things. But again, we wanted to make sure that we we're looking at developing a systemic way of implementing SEL into our school district. So for the first year, we're going to emphasize around SEL awareness. It's more about more talk, dialogue and discussion about what SEL is and understanding the framework of, where, of how we want to integrate SEL into our system. So in year one, we're going to continue the conversation around developing this SEL vision. And the great thing is that within the vision, it actually um, uh, directly reflects one of the board results, which is our well-rounded individual board results, results number three. Um, and within that results, there are many things that reference um, our SEL vision. Um, we are also going to look at ways to align SEL um, with a lot of our current um, uh, initiative and programs that are happening here throughout the district. Um, we're also going to look at, at developing uh, professional development support. Uh, we're going to continue to engage our stakeholders. We actually have a, uh, a parent conversation on October 29th um, here at CERNA, where we're going to engage and present SEL to our, our external stakeholder group to get in general uh, feedback. It's more of a feedback conversation uh, to see where they are around social emotional learning. This information is actually going to inform our SEL team, who's going to continue to work throughout the first year to really develop a plan for how we implement SEL into our district. In year two, what we're going to start doing is the learning process. So one year of self-awareness, one year of learning about what SEL is, to take all that information. We're going to learn from our networks of schools who are already doing this, who are learning this work with us as well, who's going to inform our social emotional team to really develop a, a rollout plan that will be relevant to our, our district. So in year two, we're going to look at all the data, the information we've collected. We're going to look at integrating and aligning, again, our professional learning work. We're going to look at bringing back to the board um, uh, recommendations around any type of board policy changes that may, may need to happen in order to de deepen the work around social emotional learning. Um, in year three, we're really going to look at continue alignment and resources to sustain SCL. Um, we're going to continue to learn from our district initiative partners, um, and we're going to gear up for this district-wide implementation. So we're really looking at something rolling out district-wide in 2015-2016. That's really the plan. But in the meantime, while we're looking at systemic change in our district, we're also going to do some actionable learning and steps along the way. Um, so the idea is to learn from our networks of schools to get input from our community and stakeholders and to really put together a, a well thought plan. So the superintendent wanted to leave you guys so with some So I hope by words. now you've had a chance to learn a little more about Sac City's beginning journey as part of the Collaborative District Initiative. We're really appreciative of the Novo Foundation and CASEL to be, uh, to be leading this effort and, and to, to enable us to be part of, of, of this journey. We really think that uh, as we focus on our social and emotional learning, uh, both for all of the adults that work in our school district as well as our students, we know that we're preparing them for great success, uh, for college and career, for giving them the skills and the tools that they're going to need to be su successful when they leave Sac City, whatever their path and wherever they may go. And I like to talk about, um, as we think about preparing our young people uh, for college and careers. You know, what are the skills and the tools that they're going to need to be successful? The kinds of skills that we want our young people to have when they leave us for college and, and careers. I don't think of being great at taking tests as necessarily being a, in the top ten, but I do think of, of the, the competencies that we're learning here as we take our social emotional learning journey. Uh, self awareness, knowing oneself, uh, self-management, being a able to control one's emotions, making um, good decisions, um, how, how one interacts 
uh, socially. These are the imp some of the important skill sets that our kids are learning as they become um, skilled and, and prepared for that uh, test of a lifetime. To answer any questions you may have regarding our social emotional uh, implementation plan to any questions about the networks of schools or any questions for our castle partner around uh, the partnership and the work that we'll continue to do yes um, we do have some board members who wish to make um, comment or questions however we have a public comment as well so we'll go ahead and take public comment and then we'll come back with some questions um, mr. Gabe Russ. We have three public comments on this item from Ralph Marletti, Darlene Anderson, and Grace Trujillo. I'm Ralph Marletti, Fruit Ridge area. Um, good evening, Superintendent, Representative, uh, board members, uh, presenters, teachers, and audience. Um, it looks good on paper. This is an excellent presentation. It looks good on paper and video, and certainly, an ex as I say, an excellent video and, and a nice contrast to just teaching to the test. But I do raise a few concerns or questions. Um, perhaps I'm not getting all of this, but what I say here is so, it, this looks like things that used to be parental roles things that uh, parental roles perhaps beginning, you know, more and more things being taken over by outside groups. Uh, used to be parental roles and church groups, and now we see the outside groups doing this. However, it looks good, but again, here's another concern. Um, it's not clear, does this cost our district anything financially? I, I'm not sure if that point was made. I have heard hear things of a private or federal grant, an initial planning grant of $125,000. Um, so we need, again, I'm saying these are questions I'm raising. Um, I'm glad to see there's some parental involvement here. Um, there is a concern. I have a concern over less teacher input directed teaching. Um, and finally, um, as somebody raised the question earlier this evening, is this one more program that cuts into time for subject matter competency? And uh, so all of these, these are things I have concerns over, but overall, it looks like a great program, and I wish everybody uh, best wishes on this. Thank you. Good evening, board, and to Ms. Roberts, um, Darlene Anderson. I came tonight because when I look back at the district's intervention in teaching, gosh, you know, just engagement skills with children and how children become productive citizens, citizenship. And then understanding that that was a part of the concept in public education. But then when I look at how we've actually implemented it, it's been very poorly implemented in high poverty schools. And so it was a great opportunity to come and hear the kids know about Common Core standards and how that is integrated in a unit or basically how it all comes together for a new concept. But for what the district is actually doing, which is using the student attendance and review rewards and the SARTs and collecting those data on the children who have behavior problems. I, I think you don't get to go anywhere unless you understand where you're at. And I think people in those communities really understand that they're impacted by behavior. And that's why the district got in trouble, basically. And the state had to acknowledge that they were one of the four districts that got in trouble for moving too many children from general education to behavioral programs. And I think that the way I see the district as it is currently structured is dysfunctional. I think that basically districts don't need to even exist citywide. I think basically we need to put our staff into the local schools so they can do the work. Because that work is modeled by people who understand the way it should be implemented. And the teachers really don't have that time in the classroom. And we're always short staff in the classroom.
And so it's just a different perception as to how the work should be done, but I don't see it happening because it's too great of a reach. Thank you. Hello, Diana Ardigas and members of the board and Ms. Robbins. Um, you know what? Listening to the presentation brought me back the seven habits. Actually, I've taken it. So just listening to it, six years ago, I could say precise, I took it. And I wish I would have taken it when I was younger and helped me throughout college. Because I think there's a lot of skills that sometimes people don't realize. And they say just the books. There's, there's kids sometimes that are brilliant, but they can't communicate. Or they can't handle the emotional or manage time or manage their emotions or skills or anything like that. And I think this kind of prepares them. And then there's other kids that have a hard time. Um, they don't know how to go about managing that particular aspect of education. And for me, taking it, taking that, it really helped me to become a better administrator back in my job. And at the same time, I've been incorporating those skills with my family, with financial um, relationships, how to work with the school district, how to work with my teachers, how to, how to work with society in general. You know, and I think for me, just listening, I wasn't even planning to attend the additional part, but I started listening. I said, you know what, the seven habits, that's what I did six years ago. And it's awesome that kids are doing it now. And I strongly recommend it. It's a really good program. It's a really good presentation you guys did. And I'm hoping it goes through the other schools. You know, hopefully, Phoebe Hearst always gets forgotten because it's an ideal school and it's very good. But I think all the kids could benefit from it. You know, so if you guys have in mind, please keep Caroline Winslow <laughs> and Phoebe Harris to be part of it, because I strongly recommend it. So thank you. Thank you. There are no further public comments, so we'll go ahead with board uh, member, and we'll begin with um, member Kennedy. Thank you, President Rodriguez. It's almost like it's far away. Um, could I ask uh, Mr. Idlet if you'd come forward? <laughs> I just picked you randomly as far as one of the site people that was here tonight. I, I could ask the, probably the same question of anybody. Sure. Um, first of all, could your student give the same presentation if you were drinking a glass of water? Probably not. Okay. Uh, I thought you did a fine job. Uh, the, 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 the statement was made that it takes time away from the classroom and away from... Uh, teaching and so forth. Um, do you find that to be absolutely not? And the reason why I find that it absolutely does not take away from um, the classroom or learning experiences of our students is because, for example, we as a district have a very strong focus now on the Common Core standards, and within the Common Core standards are implicitly embedded the skills that are maximized, developed, and, and extended by social emotional learning. So as we expect our students to learn the very specific academic pieces of the Common Core, the skills that they need to be in inquiry, to work collaboratively, to think creatively, to be able to write and respond uh, in a group against a uh, nonfiction text is, are skills that can be developed when we are explicitly teaching social emotional skills, social emotional learning. Um, it can seem to the adults like we're spending a whole lot of time uh, working on things that aren't necessarily what we've traditionally done, but that's kind of the point because we're in a situation presently that I think we have great opportunities to grow in engaging a variety of students who have been disengaged. And I think one of the best ways to counter some of the gigantic obstacles that are facing us are black and brown boys who are disengaged, suspension rates, um, the disconnect that we have in between all the different initiatives is by centering it around one sort of pedagogical approach. Because ultimately this is what it's about, pedagogy. This is about shifting from an adult-centered world to a student-centered world. And I can think of no other better way, even though some people say, oh, this is soft science. No, 
This is hard science about how we as adults learn not to be directive, but to be collaborative with each other and model that for our students. And those skills are gonna matter, not just now, but for the jobs that we can't predict. Because think about now, we have our superintendent speaking to us from a video, we have Skype, we have the opportunity for people to be collaborative all over the world. Those are the skills that our kids are gonna need, not necessarily how to take notes from someone talking. Thank you very much. And yeah, I, I was hoping that that would be the answer. I kind of figured it would. Um, I, I don't have a lot of questions, and it's just because you, you all did such a thorough job of a presentation. Um, so don't think it's not, it's for lack of interest. Um, as Mr. Eidlitz said, you know, the traditional ways haven't worked. Uh, they're not working for a significant portion of our students, the hardest to reach. I think this does this. I don't think I've been prouder of a program that we have gotten into in the four years I've been on this board. So I really want to say kudos to staff, kudos to you guys, site people. Um, this is just phenomenal. And I think this is really going to go a long way toward doing what we should be doing. That's educating the whole child. And, and so thank you very much for your work. Thank you. Vice President Cunha. Uh, I just wanted to echo board member Kennedy's comments. Um, I'm thankful that Castle's chosen our district to implement this work. Um, my day job, I work in the juvenile justice system. And, uh, you know, I, I find most of my clients to actually be very intellectually precocious. And when you talked about the, the competencies, it, it, it's, you know, it kind of struck me. I started remembering all the kids I had this week and uh, represented. And, you know, that's where their deficits are. That's actually mm -hmm. where they lack the ability to kind of relate and modulate emotions and do the kinds of things that we just take for granted. Um, and it begins a slow push out, uh, slow push out from education and a slow push out to uh, a system that doesn't do them, doesn't give them any advantages in life, let's put it that way. Um, so I, I'm very thankful for the work you do. I, I do have one in, in choosing us and I, I'm very excited to see how it transpires in our district and how it grows. And the one question I do have is, you know, you talked a lot, we had the McClatchy group here and we, I'm sure as you push out, you'll see other kind of like different models in the district. How, how does, you know, this approach blend with what's going on? Is it over time? I, you spoke a little bit to it, but I just can't get my head wrapped around it. So is it, you know, is it going to be a top down kind of thing? Are we going to say, here's the nomenclature that we want to use? Or are we going to, respect what's going on on the ground, but to a certain extent, you have your pedagogy, you have your experience that you know works. So I'm just looking for a little guidance on that. So as far as different methods of implementing it, I'll go ahead and a, turn it to Castle. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's a, a, a really good question to ask because uh, like I mentioned earlier, that the district really has some exemplary practices going on now that are very much in line with the, uh, the five uh, competencies, SEL competencies that we've talked about. Uh, the, the point of the initiative is to make it systemic and to embed it within the system by design and not by chance. But I will tell you, above and beyond uh, the focus on academics and the classroom and instructional practices, uh, we also had the opportunity to uh, work with the managers of the Summer of Service, the SOS group. And we came back, and I think it was in early August, and I saw Mr. Wu there, and the, the showcase of talent the research they did in the displays, and also the engaging activities that they had on the, uh, out, outside on the field really demonstrated the uh, fact that the adults not only modeled but also prepared children to engage actively, to participate collectively, to make critical decisions, and also to do the collective research that focused on bullying, anti-bullying and prevention, uh, and a number of topics that directly relate to district-wide initiatives that I think that are, are uh, significant to have children take the leadership and to do the demonstrations uh, themselves. And I think that builds the level of competency and confidence and for them to be successful in later life. So uh, it, it goes above and beyond, and it is a part of the uh, activities that you're currently having, not an add-on, but enriches uh, the delivery systems, which you're already doing. So is it, is it a sense of like respecting what's going on, uh, but adding to it or, or, or changing the nomenclature around it? Or, 
you know. Is that so I, I think I just want to make sure I understand your question. It's more about so how are we actually going to do this? Is, exactly. is that right? Uh, yes. Okay. So how are we actually going to do this? What we learned in our planning process, our planning process was pretty short. We had about a really only a good six months of really looking at how we can embed SEL into our system. What we learned from our planning process and what we learned, what we heard loud and clear was that we need to make sure we're pacing this in a way in which we're getting all of the the input from those that are most effective by this um, uh, by this initiative or process to be part of that conversation. So in our planning process, we had very little time to engage our teaching staff. And that's one thing that we want to do this year. So in our one year of, of, of SEL awareness, we're going to start having conversation with our teachers, our principals, our stakeholders, our parents, our students, and really learn about how we actually go about rolling that systemically. So again, that's why our gear up for our systemic um, implementation of SEL will not be until 2015. Um, so it's that learning process, testing it out, year two, really looking at what our CK McClatchy Network has done. How did they do it within the three different segments? What works best with teachers? What works best with principal? How are kids kind of engaged in this? Which type of programs do we want to be able to offer through the district? So we're using this year to do that piece, and we're building that. And that's where when... Um, the implementation plan, you, you see the 12 activities that the district will, will need to do. Um, basically, we're going to roll that out within three years. So we're not going to do all 12 in year one. We're going to piecemeal it and really look at what, where we are, our level of readiness, and build that plan. Okay? And, wanna, and we will be back to talk about talk it when, about we, when, we, when yeah. we get closer. <laughs> yes. Did you want to, ask I just to say a couple things. Um, thank you very much for your question. Um, I think one of the ways to think about social and emotional learning is not as a program. It is not a program. It's a process. And that's what makes it creative at the district level because we're really looking to impact four things. We're looking to impact explicit skills instruction so that the young people you were talking about, for example, they learn those skills. Every young person learns these skills. We don't hope that they happen somewhere, keep our fingers crossed, but we make sure that every student that graduates from this district has learned, assimilated, and can demonstrate those skills. That's number one. The second one is that they have the instructional pedagogy that models and reinforces those skills, it makes it just part of their instruction in every subject area. So part of that is a learning process. What do these skills look like? How do we embed them in pedagogy? third part of it is the learning environment. How do we create a learning environment, a culture and a climate that is modeling those skills across classrooms, up and down throughout the district, so that social and emotional intelligence <laughs> that comes from social and emotional learning becomes the way we do things here. Students will learn it both through the explicit instruction, they'll learn it through the pedagogy, but they'll also learn it from just watching people being in that environment reinforced day after day after day. And the final one is integration. That's looking throughout the district at every place, every curriculum, every program, where these five core competencies are being, are being taught and modeled and reinforced and getting very conscious and intentional about it. We've seen so much progress in this already just from this kind of simple explication. Here's what it is. Here's what we're trying to do. How can every one of us teach, model, and reinforce these skills every day, all day in our environments. And just becoming conscious of it begins that integration that you're talking about. So it's not so much of bringing something from someplace, but it's almost raising our own level of awareness about what's needed to make sure that every single student in the district learns these skills. I hope that makes sense. Thank you. And, and my understanding is that the, the money piece is, is, where is it directed again? The, the money, does it go to the school sites or, you know, where, where is most of that directed? I'm going to let uh, yes. Ku answer that. But I so with the budget, majority of the funding was set aside for professional learning opportunities and to support our networks of schools. And there's a little bit of administrative piece around um, outreach and training. Um, but other than that, majority of it is, is set aside for professional learning. We, we just put it on the side and said, okay, if we're going to talk about student behavior and adult learning behaviors, we need to figure out ways to have learning opportunities for that to happen. So that was set aside for that. 
Great. I, I, I just want to reiterate my um, my appreciation and thanks. I'm very excited about this in our district, and I think it's going to be good for, for the kids in our district, and I'm glad we were chosen. We have Member Bell. Well, thank you, President Rodriguez. My mic wasn't on. I'm, I was really happy to hear you say that it's a process, and I also just want to reiterate that I'm supportive of the castle work, and I'm glad that um, Sac City has now moved in that direction. Um, because along with uh, the, the Common Core and now Castle and other youth-centered initiatives, I think that we're really truly trying to become whole child-centered and live up to that results policy that we implemented. And I think those simple results policies, the simple five policies, that we put forward are really something that we can look at how they flesh out in our day-to-day -day life with youth and with the people that we serve, and it's really, uh, it's really key. And so this is, this is very important, and I'm happy to see that we're following through and we're really truly doing that work. Um, it seems to me essentially, and I kind of jotted down a couple of notes, that we're really beginning to finally shift the culture of how we educate students in this district. And I think that's huge. And I think uh, the superintendent and Dr. Roberts and, and Kua Franz and, and everyone who is, is doing this work needs to be very, very proud. Um, this is not easy. It's, um, it's not an easy task to shift a, shift a culture, but we are beginning to do that. Um, and I also was, was thinking really that essentially what you were talking about in terms of it being a, a process, that we're talking about actually the development of empathy and awareness, which is, in my opinion, supremely challenged in the culture that we live in because we live in a culture that uh, doesn't encourage awareness. We live in a basically unconscious culture, and that's what our students are growing up in and until we begin to challenge that through how they learn through adding this into the learning process we're really missing the mark entirely and I am a social worker who's worked with at risk and in risk kids for many many years and so um, it's it's like music to my ears that we're doing this type of thing so just kudos to all of you thank you for this good work it's it's amazing and and thank you so much for all that you're doing too dr. Roberts Vice President Wu. Thank you, President Rodriguez. And I want to echo what my colleagues have said. I'm very, very excited about this. And, I, and $750,000 spread over three years, that's, that's a lot of money for training. And I think that this school district will end up with a new culture. I mean, I think the culture of education for our district, for our students, for our teachers, for our administrators would change, and I think I, I can I can envision societal changes based on uh, this change in culture. I'm very very excited that we are one of those um, uh, school districts that are able to implement it early, and I hope that we can uh, really implement it throughout the district and uh, be a shining example for districts throughout the country. Uh, so I'm extremely excited, and I have to share with you that. Um, was it back in November that um, Member good. Cuneo and I were interviewed? I had no clue what I was up there being interviewed about. <laughs> and I, I remember walking away thinking to myself, I hope I didn't screw this up for the day. <laughs> so whatever it was that might have contributed to, to your decision to select um, um, our district, I'm happy to um, take credit for it. Uh, <laughs> but to the extent that... Um, you know, we, we, we might have uh, diminished the opportunity. I'm, it was him. So, but anyway, thank you very much. And I'm very, very excited for what this holds for our, the future of our school district. Thank you. Member Arroyo. Uh, thank you. And I'll try to be brief. Um, thank you for all the work that you're doing. Just a couple of quick questions uh, as follow up to uh, Vice President Cuneo's questions on the funding component to it. Mm -hmm. So. We see this as it's a three-year grant, right? Yes. Timeline-wise, we would see this type of um, impact to be really taking hold in the district in a timeline of how many years, say? 
So again, in our planning process piece, uh -huh. what the feedback we were getting was that we really need to be intentional about the work, really do some deep thinking about what's currently happening in our district. Um, there is this whole notion of education. We got to educate folks about what social emotional learning is and how it can be embedded. Um, so year one is all around um, uh, just uh, SEL awareness, having these type of conversation, figuring out um, where it's happening, um, how do we integrate, how do we align. Um, so the grant itself is a three-year grant, <clears throat> but within our planning process, so when you look at the three-year implementation grant, we're looking at rollout based on that initial planning stage of um, having some sort of district rollout in 2015, 2016. But I mean, we're talking about a, a five-year, 10-year, 12-year, 15-year, kind of like, a, I mean, because it's, it's difficult to think that in three years we'll be able to kind of penetrate throughout the district. No, no. So we won't, we won't even be penetrating the district in three years yet. It's That's all about, point. yeah. And so, so my, my question is, you know, in a timeline continuum, I mean, are we looking at a, getting an effect in, throughout the district, I say. Uh, uh, if I may, the, uh, the interest of the NOAA Foundation is to really strengthen the partnership with the CDI districts. And uh, part of the interest is to help the districts launch the uh, implementation process for SEL. However, uh, there is an interest on the part of the NOVO Foundation to continue to evaluate the effectiveness and the possibility to extend uh, the partnership even beyond the three years, but that's certainly depending on the uh, level of implementation and the effectiveness that you have shown over the next few years. Uh, most importantly, that we are actually in the beginning stages to look into other local uh, foundations and philanthropic organizations to begin to also contribute and to uh, help sustain long term and in, indefinitely the implementation process. So it's not about funding ending after three years and therefore the project uh, disappears. No, our commitment and especially of Castle and the Novo Foundation is to expand the funding revenues and to continue the funding over uh, extended period of time so that it does reach the goal of full implementation and, and effectiveness. I thank you, and that's what I really wanted to get into. I do agree with the need to expand uh, education to this level of thinking. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I think now, it's imperative that we move in that direction. There is a excuse me. There is an expectation, though, that the district also show the commitment by embedding within your budget uh, some degree of matching funds as well. So that that is a an area of interest that certainly is an ongoing dialogue, but not anything that it's uh, exorbitant. It's it's certainly looking at maybe staffing positions, in-kind uh, contributions, certainly the work that the, uh, the uh, FACE uh, the office has done uh, has been extensive, and that's more in-kind and not necessarily monetary. But it does make a big difference. And, and eventually that's what I wanted to get at. I mean, that this is the, the setting the foundation of it. As we look long-term and building capacity and really uh, make it sustainable, mm -hmm. that's what I was that trying to get goal. at. As yes. Sustainability means what and what kind mm -hmm. of investment from the district's part because, uh, as you said, uh, it's planning not only on the uh, pedagogical side and how to embed it, but also on the financial side. And, and I'm willing to have that discussion mm -hmm. as to how much we're willing to sink uh, as a district into this type of curriculum or into this type of process. Uh, but it's a tough conversation or a real conversation we need to have because it comes mm -hmm. at the expense of something else. Mm -hmm. uh, if we're really willing to go in that path and seeing those type of resources. And so I'm hoping that this will be a conversation that will continue to yes. be developed. And that's a part of the, the structure in our SEL team development mm -hmm. piece is to ensure that we are bringing back information to the board around recommendations on how we sustain the, this over time. Mm -hmm. And then I have mm -hmm. one last question is in the um, rolling out and the actually getting out into different uh, uh, into different parts of the district is how do uh, do we pick schools i mean how do we roll it out and in what manner and into what areas of yeah. the district do we go first uh second third so in in year one when we're doing our sel awareness piece we're gauging to see where our schools are um and really looking at schools that are at a certain level of readiness so one we do know one one thing we do know from our S, our uh, ck mcclatchy network piece is that first you need to develop in a, a school environment where um it, it is part of the culture of the school site where this is something that the site as a whole is willing to um uh, integrate within their school culture so 
one thing we want to be able to do is start helping schools develop their level of readiness for implementing um, SEL in their school site. So every school is at a different level of readiness. Um, but we do we do have um, in our strategy, um, it, it, our schools are networking into uh, pockets of uh, networks where they're actually uh, collaborating and discussing uh, around uh, certain uh, practices. And we're looking at ways to really provide this information to these different networks of schools. And again, it's one of those things where we're, we, we want to be able to provide them with a, a way to gauge themselves on their level of readiness, and provide them with a professional development that's necessary to get them to a place where they can start embedding some of these uh, social emotional learning opportunities. So it's basically a, mm -hmm. an opt-in. You get mm -hmm. your act together as a school to kind of move in that direction. Not in the a, first three of, years. Yeah. Not a set of criteria mm -hmm. that these are the schools that right. by assessment need it the most. And therefore, so my, my question is, mm -hmm. if there are schools that for whatever reason are lagging on getting that mm -hmm. kind of self-readiness, but they really need it, uh, will they still be? There, there will be supports available for that. So we definitely want to be able to self-identify, but yet at the same time, provide schools with those directions and supports. Yes. Look forward to hearing about it. Thank mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. Dr. Roberts. I just wanted also to add that in order to provide um, a quality implementation of the SEL um, core competencies will require us to use a dual approach. Mm -hmm. So in addition to having the early implementation sites, such as the McClatchy network, we will also need to be very um, intentional and deliberate about infusing mm -hmm. the competencies within our current work. So not only will a subset of schools do the deep dive, but alongside, parallel to that, will be the implementation in our current practices and processes, i.e., you have heard echoed tonight, Common Core. Well, embedded within the Common Core, not only do we have standards, but we also have practices, descriptors, habits of mind that our students must be able to acquire and demonstrate that are in alignment with the SEL competences. Our work that we're doing with linked learning, mm -hmm natural integration of the SEL practices. The McClatchy Network is has begun, I think two or three years ago, begun the work with PBIS, Positive Behavioral Intervention Supports. Again, a natural fit. So as we move forward, not only will we have the deep dive with the opt-in schools, but we'll also be able to continue to infuse mm -hmm. the competencies um, throughout the district through our integration and methodology of processes and practices. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Roberts. Thank you. Uh, so um, I have a lot of questions. <laughs> I'm so sorry, board. <coughs> um, first of all, I, um, I'm excited because core competence or the core, um, yeah, core competencies, uh, work plan, um, you know, everything just speaks of quality management here, right? Lean, Six Sigma, mm -hmm. it's all tying in together here. Um, so I'm assuming that you might have some answers readily available um, for some of the questions that I have. All right, um, so, and it's only because I'm excited that I know, you know, I know all of this process and I see it glaring. Um, so we have the first question, and I'm going to address my questions according to the people who came forward for public comment, and then I'll get into my own questions. So the cost to the district of the $250,000 per year, seven fifty dollars um, through the lifespan of the three-year um, grant is primarily for professional development and um, in learning, right? Um, and then the district is taking either a 50% or 70% um, participation on two positions. Mm -hmm. And so how does this affect our budget, um, you know, and, and where, where are we finding this money from when we're, mm -hmm. you know, in, in our crisis right now? What budget um, source is it coming out of? 
So, so currently, right now, what is being invested or uh, district investment, it, it's pretty much just time. There's no actual uh, um, matching, uh, actual fiscal matching funds for this grant. We are actually using the 250000 to provide the professional development, the trainings. We're actually um, uh, use, utilizing that fund to support some of our current position, um, our, bowling, uh, our bowling specialist position. It's also, uh, well, there, there's going to be a need for a coordinator for this as well to to kind of coordinate the work itself. Right now, the district is actually not investing any additional uh, funds into this three-year commitment. It's more around just time, district time. Um, and again, when we're talking about staff time, we're talking about staff that are currently working on, on like projects. So it's it, it's embedded within the work that that we are already doing. Um, it's actually infusing the work that we're doing. Um, I'd like to have a little bit more clarity mm -hmm. on page five then mm -hmm. uh, of your work plan. Mm -hmm. And this is align resources to support academic, social, and emotional learning programming. And then you have one full time SEL coordinator that is funded 50% yes. by the district. Mm -hmm. And then another full time bullying prevention specialist that is again percent, uh, funded 70% yes. by the district. Um, so we're so the, the percentage is grant funded as well. So through our California endowment fundings, um, again, these positions are, are grant funded positions. So, mm -hmm. so what I hear you saying then mm -hmm. is that 50% of that one position and 70% of the other position is being funded by the California, California endowment, endowment, not mm -hmm. through SCUSD. No, well, it's a, a grant awarded to SCUSD. So it's our grant fundings again. Okay, mm -hmm. and that's allowable under that grant. Yes. Okay. Yes. <clears throat> so, um, and the other question about will this be implemented at all sites at the same time, mm -hmm. or you know, which which, and that makes sense about the readiness factor. Mm -hmm. um, so, talking about readiness factor, then um, do we have a transition plan in pl um, that is being developed, or has it been developed, and do you have a change management process along with that? So, as far as transition plan for the sustainability piece over time, is that what you're talking about, or? No, on how are you going to implement this across the district and all schools? And again, that's part of the, the learning process here. Um, we're, we're in the process, it's a three-year um, implementation plan where there's a, there's a bit of planning and implementation at the same time. Those are, those are the type of questions that we want to make sure that we're engaging the right stakeholders in, in those conversation. Um, so it, it, the plan itself is something that's being developed through, through this implementation plan. Um, so those are the type of questions that I would definitely take back to our SCL team to address as we develop this district-wide rollout for 2015 to embed those type of transitional um, and pieces into it. Did you want to respond mm -hmm. to that? Did you want to add? Yeah, just mm -hmm. a, a quick uh, observation that uh, we have found out that simultaneous and systemic implementation doesn't always work. And there is a degree of readiness. And I think what's happening now, the, the work that is uh, going on is, is part of the awareness raising. It's the, uh, the training, uh, the trainer of trainers, which will be coming online at the end of this month. And they, in turn, go out and uh, work with the uh, faculty and staff. And then the invitation will continue in the different phases for those schools that are interested and they're ready. And hopefully, during the period of awareness and over the next three years, you'll have uh, reached closer to that goal of having uh, universal and systemic implementation. Ultimately, that is the goal. But I think it's the momentum has to pick up. The McClatchy uh, network it was a, a prime example of a, a, a system of schools that have already done systemic implementation of PBIS. So in effect, we saw that as being ready. They have a high level of articulation. They have consistency in the programs from the elementary, middle school, and high school. And so I think there, there, there was some uh, factors there that really contributed to that decision. It doesn't mean the other schools weren't ready. This was one that kind of stood out initially. But uh, as time goes on, I think the invitation will go out to begin to include more schools throughout the district. And hopefully, this will become a, you know, a system-wide and universal implementation over a short period of time. I think what I'm to clarify my, my question on transition plan is what is your plan to prepare or to ready the sites that are not ready right now? Mm -hmm. um, because they're not going to get ready on their own, obviously. And it doesn't mean that you have to 
you know, do these pilots at these particular schools all the way to find out what the end result is or what the outcome is. But at the same time, you have to do some readiness activities at these other sites. And I, I, I just want to reference uh, Dr. Olivine's comment about earlier about it's about embedding these company skill sets into things as we roll out our, our other um, um, teaching practices that we're rolling out, our other instructional practices that we're doing. So it's it's not so much about, uh, and you stated so well earlier, you know, it, it's about already looking at focus schools who, who are ready and who are willing to do this work and focus on that. But then at the same time, looking at our district practices and really embedding the SEL company skill set within those practices that are going out the door. So it's it's not anything in addition. Um, it is something that we, we are intentionally embedding into everything that comes out of the district. So that's the transitional piece I think that you're looking for. How do we internally build our capacity and expertise to assure that SEL continues over time? And that's that's the, the culture shift that uh, 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 Member Bill talked about. It's, it's about changing the way we do our work so that it is it becomes our practice. It's just something we do. And, and that's where the, the level of efficiency I think that you're referring to is that eventually this is just something we do. It's embedded into our practices. It's part of uh, how we do our before, our during, and after school programs. It's, it's all part of um, what we, we do as a district. So I hope that answered that question. It's, it's nothing, it's not supposed to be something additional. It's supposed to be embedded into our practices. Okay, mm -hmm. so then um, yeah. probably what I should be looking for, and it would be, I'm gonna move from this question, would be a transition plan on Common Core uh, standards rather than looking for something from this group. Yeah. So um, now to move on, you know, I, I just wanna make a comment about this program, the you know, SEL in and of itself. I wish that we had this, you know, 20 years ago because you see so prevalent um, in the workplace now, many of these bullying issues and um, you know, a lack of social um, adaptability um, to other cultures and a lack of understanding. And so there was a, a person who came up and said about, uh, made a mention about others taking on the roles of parents. Mm -hmm. And I don't see it like that. I do see this as a process, but I see it in, in the form of the process is organizing a large task, you know, to implement social and emotional learning is it's a human behavior. Mm -hmm. And so and it's it's organizing this to ensure that you have an accurate analysis, number one. And number two, that you're reinforcing um, positive social behaviors across all children and adults. And that's the sustainable part of this. You know, it's not going to take money, um, and I always say that. It's, it's, a, it's the mindset change, like Member mm -hmm. Bell said, um, but how do we get there? And so along with that, then I'm gonna talk about, um, I, I, I'm looking at your year one, and I don't see, and maybe you can point it out to me, I don't see anywhere where we're engaging parents and community into this process, especially when you're looking at the gap analysis. And by the way, I think there's, some few, there's a few steps missing before we get to the gap analysis. Mm -hmm. I think we can agree to that it's missing in this plan. So um, where do I find the engagement of parents in year one? So it's part of our communi communicate about academic, social, and emotional learning with a variety of stakeholders on page five on um, the implementation plan. And again, this is again communicating with uh, all of our stakeholders. We're talking about um, both internal, external work groups. Um, within our structure, our actual SCL team structure, we're looking at uh, creating work groups and focus groups where we're making sure we're, we're not only getting the parent voices, the family voices, the community partners voices, but our student voices as well. Um, so it's all embedded in, in that one, the, the structure in which we were, will move the work forward and then the other piece is the continuous communication and engagement um, that we'll do with our stakeholders. Mm -hmm. and, and again, we're doing our first conversation around social emotional learning with our, our parents and, and community partners on October 29th um, here in, at CERNA. So it's an open invitation for the boards to come out and, and hear what parents are talking about and what parents will need, you know, it, it, as we move towards developing more social emotional um, opportunities, what type of supports and resources will our parents need? Um, so I do invite you to come out to that, that conversation as well.
Thank you for the invitation on that. Um, I'm, unfortunately, I'll let you know right now, I am out of town on that day. Um, but I say the part about the parents because we had the third commenter that came in the public comment is we have an identified champion. And you know what champions are. And so, I mean, she came forward and said, hey, I'm familiar with this program. And, you know, who knows how many other parents we have of the 44,000 students that we have in our pre-K through adult ed that are champions already. And how are we going about the business of finding our champions mm -hmm. so that they can help with the readiness part? Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I think a thorough search needs to happen so that it makes this program more successful mm -hmm. and it cuts the implementation time as well. I, I agree. And I, and I think it's also about the awareness factor again. The more we communicate about this, the more we outreach and, and talk about this, the more we'll be able to find champions within our, our community to move this work forward. Mm -hmm. And is there an events calendar that you have already? I see that there's some stuff um, that is planned, mm -hmm. um, it, you know, the work, this work plan doesn't actually have actual dates actual yet. Dates. Yes. Yes. So, is there an events calendar of some sort that you have? So, when we've uh, developed the the work plan, it was we we did not know for sure yet whether or not we were going to be selected to be part of the implementation plan. We have just heard back earlier last week that we have been selected, and so the team is moving pretty fast as far as looking at putting some actual dates to these timelines. So, when we have our our year out our year plan uh, of events and dates, we'll be sure to send that to the board. Excellent, mm -hmm. I understand that response. Um, so you guys are currently working on the work breakout schedule then. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, and so the other part that I have, and I see that it's part of here in the develop a district-wide vision, it's on page one, and you're conducting an audit of the board um, policies. Mm -hmm. um, and then on the next page, we have an actual date of October 18th. Mm -hmm. And that's, um, you know, to do this presentation here for the buy-in process, right? Mm -hmm. um, but my concern is, is that are we going to, we as the board, are we going to see the process analysis of our, uh, are we going to see those flow charts? Are we going to see our current policies, where the gaps are, where we need to improve it? And then also, um, where, are we going to have the opportunity to provide input mm -hmm. on the planning process of when we think realistically when we can mm -hmm. um, address those policies and then how we can revise them and, and what's um, what's to take place. Are we going to go through stakeholder process or, or mm -hmm. whatnot? So that's definitely a really good um, recommendation and comment because that's exactly the type of feedback we were hoping to get tonight so that we can bring that back to the SEL team um, and really go back and look at how we how we engage the board in, in this process as well. Yeah. So my, my answer to that is yes, we definitely want to be able to come back and provide where that gap of the gap analysis of where the different policies are at, provide some recommendation for the board to have a discussion. We, we can definitely do that as part of our um, uh, SEL team um, work plan. I think the right answer was yes, board, yes. you will be involved in this. <laughs> So those are all the um, the questions that I have, and I thank you for, very much for your patience um, on this. And I don't see any other board member um, questions at this time. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on to 9.2, Resource Conservation uh, Incentive Program is information item, 15-minute presentation, five-minute discussion. Greg Heberling and Vera 